How does the process of predictive analytics actually work? Well, we've got the data in the learning record store. That is then passed to the learning analytics processor, another part of the overall system. And that's the brains behind the, old, the whole system. It has a predictive model behind it, which is developed by looking at the records of previous students and then comparing the student against those records. And it itself is comprised of a number of different indicators showing the percentage influence on the actual score or success of the student of those indicators. So we might, for example, have access to the VLE being the number one indicator of whether a student is going to succeed or not. We might have attendance at classes uh, being another one that's got a high influence. And this, this is the basis of the model. And what's quite interesting is that that model isn't necessarily fixed on one institution. Marist College, for example, in the US has shown that that model can be taken from a university and transferred to colleges and still have a high degree of accuracy in predicting student success. Learning analytics is not just about predictive analytics. It also uses other techniques, and I'm going to talk about three more of those. So one of these is discourse analytics, and this uh, analyzes how students are engaging in discourse. Talking to each other, communicating is a vital part of education. Students develop their skills in argumentation, in looking at things from different perspectives, for example. And you can measure that through students' use of tools such as blogs, wikis, forums. You can look at the number of times they post to a forum, for example, and do all that kind of quantitative analysis. Other researchers are becoming quite interested in qualitative analysis of the discussions. So seeing what kind of vocabulary is used by the students, uh, sentence structure, and these th sort of aspects of discourse, which again can be very good indicators of whether a student is predicted to do well or not. Another technique that we're seeing being used in educational applications is social network analysis. This comes from other fields such as sociology, anthropology, biology, economics, and it can be used wherever individuals are part of groups and we want to see the connection between individuals and how well they integrate with each other. So in education, as students are interacting through uh, forums or other methods, we can see how well they connect to each other and we can see if an individual is socially isolated uh, and then we can take an intervention and try and bring that individual back into the group. A third technique that we see being used increasingly is sentiment or emotion analytics. As students work through their studies, they face a whole range of emotions. And clearly a student who is happy, who is motivated, enthused, is probably more likely to do better than a student who is disappointed, disillusioned, depressed, uh, bored. Uh, so it's possible to see what these emotions are uh, that students are experiencing by analysing the text that they're producing uh, in, in discussion with each other or even analysing the content of video or audio conferences they're having with each other. Clearly there are ethical issues in this and some of the other techniques and uh, we need to be thinking very carefully about privacy issues and obtaining students' consent before we go ahead with some of these techniques. Clearly to make good use of learning analytics we need to build a data-driven culture at our institutions and it's really for every institution to think about how to do that in its own way. But uh, learning analytics is, is, is a great catalyst for trying to look at a new way of taking decisions. We have so many different data sources now that we're able to integrate them in new and interesting ways and take our decisions on how to support individual students and change what's offered to students based on evidence rather than merely intuition.